So today we have a panel which is composed of Dr. Nomsa Dlamini from the CSR Advanced Agriculture and Food Cluster. She's a principal scientist. We also have Dr. Tawanda Mujingi from International Potato Center SIP. He's a regional scientist and is based in Nairobi. We also have Professor Trust Beta from uh, Food Science uh, Canada, and she's a researcher at the University of uh, Manitoba in Canada. And I'm um, Eric Chakao, I'm the network manager for Nepad Sun Bio, which is um, a program and uh, in, hosted by the CSR, the Center of Excellence on Food and Nutrition for Nepad. So welcome. Our topic today um, is very exciting. You know, we are based in the Sadak region. The Sadak region is more than 350 million people. And the issues, there are a number of issues that we grapple with as a region. And uh, nutrition issues are also as critical. We talk of availability of food, accessibility of food, and of course the utilization, which is the availability of the food in our bodies. Um, and can our bodies mobilize that kind of uh, food to get the nourishment that we, that we need? What I want us to note from the presentation is what, when we talk of nutrition, in the context of the Sadak region, what are we talking about? And what is the future of nutrition when we talk of Sadak and also the continent? And where is the role of indigenous foods in all this? What's the role of the small grain, um, like your sorghum and your millets, which traditionally they are grown in the region? And they're also climate smart. So we are looking at looking at the future of sustainability and the environment, but we're also looking at nutrition in the context of production and availability uh, and utilization, as I mentioned. So I will give an opportunity to Dr. Nomsa Damini to give a presentation. My name is Nomsa. And my presentation today is looking at how innovative agro-processing technologies can contribute to improved nutrition and food security using specifically indigenous uh, plants. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Basically, I'm gonna introduce the topic, look at South Africa's plant biodiversity and how CSR has been involved in historic research on food. We'll look at how this South African biodiversity can contribute to food nutrition and wellness and the product development we've done at CSR. And of course, we don't work alone. We also work with collaborators. So that's, I'll look at our collaborations. I'll touch on them during the presentation as we move along. Um, climate uh, change, as we all know, will affect food production and therefore affecting food availability. So what is climate change? It can be drought, which is what is most prevalent in Southern Africa or in Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, uh, increasingly, um, this is affecting food availability. Sub-Saharan Africa, where most of Africa lies, is one of the most food insecure regions of the world, where people face challenges of, of malnutrition, um, specifically with children. We know that if children are affected, it affects our future generation. Most of the malnutrition is not always visible because the visible malnutrition is normally stunting or, or showing signs of starvation. But we have what is called micronutrient deficiency, which is mostly vitamin A, iron deficiency. And this is termed heat and hunger. Of course, this will, does affect the health of the children. And South African biodiversity and African biodiversity at large can help alleviate or help, help alleviate this type of malnutrition. Um, well, I just thought I'll just give an overview of South African plant biodiversity in terms of um, the indigenous plants that are there. We have over 24,000 plants, that is 10,000 of the world's uh, plants, which is, quite a, which is quite huge. And some of our biomass is quite unique, and most of it is still unexplored. 
but we know that indigenous uh, peoples have been using these for medicines, for food, and nutraceuticals. And modern day, we're also looking at these plants also to harvest or to use as uh, new food ingredients in many aspects, especially food and, and the fact that we are facing malnutrition. Um, this is just to summarize the history of uh, food research in, at CSR. It started in 1963, and of course we can go way back, but this is when it was first recorded where plants were collected from the field, analyzed, and they were recorded. Several publications were produced, as well as uh, in vivo toxicity. We know that when you have plants and they are not harvested, you can have some toxic components. Some of the plants we have, we commonly consume, can also contain toxins, but of course we know how to deal with this. In terms of uh, what we're doing in advanced agriculture and food, we have a group which is called agroprocessing, and we have strategic objectives. Uh, basically, the group uh, which sits within the agro-processing and food cluster, we, we have skills and expertise in developing innovative food products that can um, help alleviate nutrition. We use indigenous plants and also sustainably resourced, um, sourced ingredients. We also contribute to establishment of um, small industries we know that most of uh, job markets will be created by up-and-coming industries, small industries, or entrepreneurs. So we also contribute to establishment of those so that when they enter the market, they are using natural-based products that have been validated for quality and they are compliant to regional regulations. In terms of South Africa's biodiversity, I think uh, Dr. Chakawi has mentioned that we have indigenous plants that in most cases they are still underutilized. We have sorghum, pale millet, these are the small grains, they are drought tolerant, they are they're climate smart, they will grow with minimum rainfall. And of course we know that there are other plants as well. We have indigenous legume grains which are high in protein. Uh, we have Bambara, which is Vigna, ungi, Vigna subterranea, and we have cowpea, which is Vigna ungiculata. They are utilized, and we can use them in various products to develop products. And, 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 and as I've mentioned, we don't work alone. We collaborate. Um, our funder is Department of Science and Innovation in South Africa. The Indigenous Knowledge Systems, they fund our, our research. We also collaborate with Agricultural Research Council which develops cultivation methods for these plants, because some of them haven't been cultivated at, 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 at large scale. They are not commercialized. Uh, some of them, people still harvest them from the wild. You wait for the rainy season to harvest them. We also work with the universities. We also work with communities. Communities are very important, because at the end of the day, they are the ones who are going to adopt these technologies, adopt these plants for commercialization, for job creation, and also for, to provide food, for food security. This is just to illustrate the value chain of agro-processing and product development that we follow. Um, once we identify a plant which has huge potential, even in terms of its nutritional content, in terms of um, people lacking to have the product or the plant, we develop cultivation methods, and for that, as, as I mentioned, we work with ARC, which is Agriculture Research Council. They develop these methods. Um, at CSR, then we come in because we do mostly primary processing and product development. And of course, in some cases, um, you find that we have to extract active ingredients, especially with nutraceuticals. Nutraceuticals, basically, you have a food plant which has added health benefits. That's when we attract, we extract the active ingredients and then we can formulate. As you can see, we work with communities. We also train them. We, we learn from them and we help them adopt technologies. So it's, a, it's, it's all of a learning process. In terms of uh, developing uh, nutritious products, we have one flagship product that we've developed with the rural school children in mind, which was to help address um, malnutrition in school children. We know that these children, in most cases, they walk long distances to school, they haven't eaten. So we developed a nutri-drink which uses um, 
indigenous crops that are grown by the local uh, people and processed. The CSR came in in terms of training them to process it in a standardized way so that the food product is safe. We tested this nutri drink in the Eastern Cape and we found that it did really improve the nutritional status of the children. And the children looked forward to coming to school all the time. So the picture just shows, just illustrate the children happy to, to have this product. It was a pilot product project. So the product is still available at CSR. It's ready to be commercialized and marketed. In terms of some of our other products where we've used indigenous ingredients, we've used leafy vegetables. We are all familiar with amaranthas, with cleom where we've used them, because we know that they are high in uh, phytochemicals, which is your polyphenols, your flavonoids, and also your iron and zinc. We formulated products which we think people will love. Um, we had herbal teas. We all know herbal rooibos from South Africa. But we found that using even other plants that are, that are not rooibos, you can still get a herbal tea with health benefits. We've done uh, muffin mixes. I've mentioned the drink for the school nutrition, which it did with DSI. And we've also canned, um, like producing convenient food products. Um, historically, like I've said, CSR has done some product development. These are some of the products that we're using, that we've produced, um, starting with fermented products, which are used as winning, winning foods. Insects, we know insects are are creating a hype because of their protein content and because of their sustainable production. We worked with Mopane, which is a local, um, I would call it a worm, but it's, it's a delicacy. I tell you, there's marula, there's also other whole grain products mixed from, made from mixed grains, amadumbe, which, is, which are made from an indigenous uh, tuba. We've also adopted other technologies in terms of uh, trying to process these into convenient products. We know that some of these crops, uh, they take a long time to cook, so they consume a lot of energy, firewood in the rural areas or even in towns, electricity. So for us to then improve or rather increase the chances of them being adopted as part of our daily diets, we have introduced um, convenient processing technologies like microwave technology, which will shorten the cooking time or even extrusion cooking. Uh, we've worked with communities, like I've mentioned. Uh, we work with universities in one community. We worked with a community in Alice, where the University of Forte is found. The, the university actually has an agro-processing facility which houses the community. They came in, they were trained, they participated. They actually produced the nutri drink that was piloted in the Eastern Cape, like as I've mentioned before. And yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, um, Namsa, for the good presentation. Um, I also noted a few things, uh, very interesting things that we, the CSR is learning with the communities, learning from the communities. The communities are also learning from the CSR. And I think that's a very mutual relationship. I also noted the issue of commercialization or getting the products to the user. We need to create jobs. We need to be healthy. Uh, we need to have a strong bioeconomy. So these products definitely will make a difference. Um, so our my next presentation will be coming from uh, Dr. Tawanda Mjingi, as I mentioned, is from SIP, based in, in Nairobi. Tawanda, the uh, floor is yours. I was just introducing uh, the organization I work for, the International Potato Center. We are headquartered in Lima, Peru, and um, we have a presence in Africa, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. Our regional office is in, in Nairobi, Kenya. But we have uh, in Southern Africa, we have presence in in Mozambique, in Malawi, um, and we have activities um, in South Africa and Zambia. Uh, we used to be in Angola, um, and we also have some presence in in Tanzania, which are all the countries. Uh, not forgetting the work that we also do in in Madagascar. 
So we promote uh, sweet potato and potato agri-food systems to improve our livelihoods um, and nutrition for people in these regions. So to us, uh, potato and sweet potato, uh, in particular sweet potato, I think they are climate, we can call them climate smart crops um, because of um, how they can contribute to uh, resilience um, in the food system to improve nutrition. So we focus more on the orange uh, flesh sweet potato, um, which is orange in color when you cut it. Uh, most people are familiar with white sweet potato. Um, some are familiar with the cream ones, some are familiar with the purple ones. But in Southern Africa, I know since I am a native, we are used to the white ones and the cream fleshed ones. The orange ones are not so common. But the orange are orange because of beta carotene, the same thing you find in, uh, in carrots and pumpkins, and the body converts it to vitamin A. And in Southern Africa, vitamin A is one of those big public health challenges that we are trying to solve. Um, and sweet potato is one of the most important crops for human nutrition globally. In Sub-Saharan Africa, about 50 million farmers grow it uh, and it is consumed on a regular basis. So the orange one, as I mentioned, it, it produces, it provides vitamin A uh, for children. Just 125 grams alone can meet the recommended daily allowance for school, for school children. And this is huge. 100 grams is not much, maybe it's one tablespoonful or one cup of boiled sweet potato. So what are the challenges we are facing right now? In, because of climate change, our cities are growing in, in, in Africa. Um, you can see from the chat that in, in Lagos, for instance, these are the number of people getting into the cities every day. In Johannesburg, you find there are like 21 people being added every hour to the cities. Uh, with climate change, more people are going to be moving from the rural areas coming into the cities. And it, it is anticipated that most of the food will be grown around cities and most of the food will be grown, will be consumed in the cities. So how, how, how do we prepare ourselves for this um, changing population dynamics? So I, I've spoken about the proof of concept studies we did over the years to show that orange fresh sweet potato can provide uh, adequate vitamin A to children and adults. Um, and um, in Southern Africa, sweet potato is it's a seasonal crop. Um, it's grown uh, during the rainy season. Um, but we know that in other regions uh, of Africa, like Central Africa, East Africa, they've got two growing seasons. So farmers can grow two crops uh, and have two harvests. So how do we make sweet potato um, more available to communities in Southern, in Southern Africa so that they can benefit from the nutrition and it can, it can also produce um, uh, a good yield uh, and supply to, to processors or to, to value addition uh, opportunities. So we see that it's an opportunity for us to, to, to be innovative. We have uh, done some work um, on storage to improve access uh, using solar. Uh, we did some trials in Mozambique uh, to see if farmers can do this uh, in an efficient way uh, on a smaller scale. Um, in addition to the traditional methods of uh, sand pit storage, um, but you can also do at a large commercial level where you can uh, store tons and tons of sweet potato under uh, climate controlled conditions. Uh, in terms of post harvest research, um, we can make sweet potato available to, to, to people throughout the year by processing. Uh, like Dr. Namside is, is indicated, we can have a flour uh, that can be incorporated into porridges that people can consume. It can be stored over a long period of time. But the challenge is you, for, for orange fresh sweet potato, you can lose the nutrition, especially beta carotene. We have now moved to a puree-based application where you steam the sweet potatoes and then they can be eaten directly for, for children as a porridge or as a paste. They can be incorporated into processed food products uh, like bakery products, fried products, and confer good nutrition to people. And now we have technologies to make it shelf stable uh, so you don't require refrigeration since it's a very perishable product. 
and then we can have a nutrition being provided to people in the cities who need um, to get good nutrition because most of them don't have the land to, to be growing the crops on a yearly basis. So we have done this in, in, with bakeries in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Kenya, using the puree, and it has been commercialized. And um, on, the, on the side note, we are also doing the same in South Africa, and we hope in, in the coming year we'll be launching these products uh, and target the bottom of the, of the pyramid consumers. So there, there is demand uh, for, for baker application because of the over-reliance of wheat. Um, and I'm talking about baker product because you know in, sub in Southern Africa, bread is a staple. Most people don't see that it that way. And we consume a lot of wheat and we waste a lot of resources importing wheat. We, list, we, we use a lot of agricultural inputs to produce wheat, which is not sustainable, but we can, we can, we can dedicate half the resources to sweet potato and to have a locally grown ingredient that can still allow us to enjoy our bread and also get nutrition out of it. Um, Nigeria, for instance, they, they saw this and they put a policy in place to make cassava flour mandatory with 10% substitution. We believe with sweet potato puree, we can do a better job and do up to 50% wheat flour substitution, but also providing the vitamin A that people need. And I think we can have the same policies in Southern Africa, in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Malawi, South Africa, Namibia, and Zambia, where um, bread consumption is really high among the low income consumers. So with, uh, with orange flesh sweet potato, we are talking about bio, it's, it's, it's called a biofortified crop because we do breeding as an institution to um, enhance the resilience of the crop and also increase the, the micronutrient content uh, by plant breeding. Uh, it, but we tend to focus more on conventional breeding as opposed to uh, transgenic approaches. So the orange flesh sweet potato, once biofortified, it can be grown in different uh, regions of the world, in different regions of, of, of Southern Africa. So we have a breeding hub for sweet potato in Southern Africa, in Mozambique, that focuses on, on drought tolerance and uh, drought resistance. So this, uh, we can be uh, assured that the sweet potato that is grown in the region uh, is climate smart. So why is sweet potato climate smart? Um, we know that um, within a short period of time, within three to four months, you can have a, a decent harvest from the crop. It, it's, it's a short maturing crop and it produces tons and tons of, 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 of yield with very little inputs, very little uh, moisture and um, very little fertilizer application, actually no, most farmers in, in, in Southern, they don't use pesticides, they don't use fertilizers for sweet potato. And it is, it's the second crop after jackfruit in terms of the number of calories produced per hectare globally. So as compared to maize and wheat that we rely on so much, uh, this is an, a crop that is easy to manage and that can provide lots of food over a short period of time. And with access to irrigation, you can grow it continuously as long as you've got water, and uh, high temperatures. So now, because we are facing uh, emergencies like COVID, um, we are seeing that there's, there's a greater need to incorporate sweet potato into the food systems, both for food security reasons and for providing micronutrients that people need. Um, we are also seeing that um, in, 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 in urban areas where people are constrained economically, like now with COVID, there's less incomes in, people tend to consume more of the staples and they consume less of animal source foods and fruits and vegetables. So sweet potato is one of the staples that people are going towards. And if we have this staple biofortified and produced um, um, by communities, it can help us mitigate the, the, the effects of climate change and the effects of, of, of pandemic, which I think are also a result of climate change. Um, we can uh, improve the livelihoods of people um, so we know that, um, like for other countries, like in Mozambique, um, for instance, um, where there is a growing salinity, where some communities are they are dependent on rice. Um, we know that sweet potato, that varieties that we are breeding, can grow under saline conditions. We have tested this work in in Bangladesh, 
where um, rice fields that were no longer able to sustain rice production were successfully transformed into sweet potato based production systems. So the loss of agricultural land due to um, encroachment of the sea, uh, it can be mitigated by adoption of sweet potato production, which also contributes to um, provision of, uh, of nutrition and food to, to communities um, on a regular basis. And we saw that, I mean, when there are floods, uh, for instance, our work in the Philippines show that when they are flooding, um, sweet potato is one of the crops that remains on the, on the ground. Uh, other crops are destroyed. So we see that with climate change, there's prolonged droughts. And when the rain comes, it's a lot of rain. And then uh, all the crops are destroyed. But sweet potato is one of the crops that remains and can provide uh, people with food at the, at the moment and can also help it with the recovery aspect because it's a short, uh, it's a short cycle crop. Um, so what can we do um, in, 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 in Southern Africa? Uh, we are seeing, as I mentioned, a rapid urbanization in, 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 in cities like Johannesburg, uh, Lusaka, Harare, Maputo. So we need to um, move away from a, a subsistence farming based approach to also incorporate an in, in, in urban consumer centric approach because malnutrition issues are really a big problem in our urban areas and not a lot of attention is being paid. So we need uh, ways to improve the markets um, of, um, of, of, of fruits and vegetables and also root and tuber crops and understand the, the dynamics, uh, the consumer dynamics in the informal sector and the whole value chain and, and provide uh, technologies to stabilize the prices, to have um, market um, approaches in terms of storage and processing as well, so that we have mass dissemination of these nutritious crops. Uh, we also want to um, engage uh, the private sector um, and uh, make them work with the public sector. We know that if we're going to go to scale with these proven technologies, we cannot do it alone as a public uh, research institute or public um, development agencies. We need to work with private sector, especially the food industry, because they have um, the mechanisms and the structures in place to deliver food in an efficient manner to many people than we can uh, with public resources. So we need to work with governments and have policies that can um, incentivize the, the, the private sector to be part of the problem, um, to, 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 be, to solve uh, the problems that we have uh, in, in Southern Africa, for instance. So what, what we need to do, um, we, we may want to have um, improvements in, in seed supply chains. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, suppliers are not affected uh, or they have access to, to seed, not just access to seed, but they have access to certified seed. Uh, they've got the, the support, the agronomic support, and they've got also mark, uh, access to markets where they can be assured that whatever they grow at the commercial level would have um, an uptake from the market. Um, we also need to understand um, how to uh, incorporate um, our, our farmers so that it's a win-win situation. You know, most of the farmers, they complain for lack of access for their commodities. So we want to be able to give them access to, to markets and also for governments and donors to uh, help farmers with um, schemes that can uh, mitigate the risk of um, overproducing some of the commodities in case of um, a low demand or other agricultural um, or climatic catastrophes. So uh, with that, I would like to, to come to the end of my conclusion um, and also thank you for your, for your time. Um, uh, this is a picture of my colleague. Uh, we have a, a, a nutrition and a food science lab um, in Nairobi, Kenya, which is called the Food and Nutritional Evaluation Lab. It's, it's a regional uh, center of excellence for uh, food and nutrition analysis. We have state-of-the-art equipment. So we support countries in Central Africa, in West Africa, in Southern Africa with their needs to, to analyze uh, any type of nutritional and food analysis and food safety. And we also give um, researchers from the regions um, the platform to be trained and to use our resources to, to, to gain knowledge 
and um, participate in capacity building. Uh, we believe that uh, training the human resource base in Africa will enable us to, to, to overcome the challenges of climate change as it affects our food systems and our nutrition security. So if you, if you need to learn more about uh, the work that we do, uh, feel, please feel free to contact me or Dr. Eric uh, for more details. We can um, link you up with the available resources we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dawanda. Um, I liked the the call to action that we need to put more resources on these um, climate smart crops, uh, including the sweet potato. You really solved it quite well to me. Um, I like the import <coughs> substitution. If we put more resources on researching on orange flesh sweet potato or just sweet potato in general, maybe we might not need that much wheat. So, but it also comes, just comes to how much how much uh, resources we put and also how much effort we put on researching on this. And um, then we can have bread all the time, which is good. So thank you very, thank you very much. Our next presentation is going to come from um, Professor Beta. The talk will touch on the few bulleted items there. When I think of climate, smart crops, the first question that comes to my mind is how are we defining them? So we've had this uh, terminology applied uh, all over the place now, now that we are facing real challenges with our climate and all the changes that are happening. So I'm going to look at how are they being defined and how we can actually select for climate smart crops. And the, what we have learned from the first two speakers has been very helpful to talk about these issues. Uh, sorghum and millets, they are my passion because most of my graduate training were on these uh, two sets of crops. Uh, legumes are also being considered as climate smart crops. So I'm going to look at some of those and the global value chain briefly and how we can integrate the climate smart crops, the global value chain and food security. So my assumption when I hear about the climate smart crops are a list of things the first thing I tend to think of is, well, it has to be high yielding if it's, a, if it's climate smart. So no matter how the climate is changing, this type of crop must be adaptable such that it can still remain high yielding. It can still be disease resistant and it can be drought tolerant, especially for the Southern African region. So those are agronomic factors that are important for any variety of crop to be adopted by the farmer. But I'm a food scientist, so the next important criteria I would look at if it's a climate smart crop is, is it nutritious? So nutrition is very important, as Dr. Mjink has pointed out, uh, biofortification to increase the vitamin A levels in, in sweet potatoes. At the same time, people hardly eat for just nutrition. They want the food to be delicious. So it has to be delicious before anyone can buy into that food. So we have to combine nutrition and test uh, the obvious parameter is it has to be uh, toxic free. So whatever climate smart uh, crop that we want uh, our farmers to grow must be free of any uh, toxic material. <clears throat> what has been uh, a drawback for some of the crops that are considered climate smart is the issue of processing which we have to really take seriously. Is this crop processable? Is it easy 
to convert into various food products. <clears throat> then lastly, marketability. So it can be as a raw material, it can be following processing some of those products. So then can we have climate smart crops that can be processed into diverse, tasty and nutritious food products? So that's a very important uh, criteria to address. So I have on the screen a number of grains from barley, from wheat, from maize, from sorghum. So how do we identify what we call a climate smart crop? What criteria do we want to apply if a crop is going to fall into this group of uh, smart dudes, I guess we can call them smart dudes. So among the cereals, we hardly consider the ones such as wheat, maize or rice as the climate smart crops, because we want uh, a crop that has some kind of uh, adaptation to adverse climatic conditions and some sorghum varieties have been found to be in that category. I did come across uh, this interesting paper by Dr. Jiri and his colleagues. The title was Climate Smart Crops for Food and Nutritional Security for Semi-Arid Zones of Zimbabwe. So in that paper, the conclusion was that resource poor farmers are affected by, by drought effects due to climate change Therefore, they can adopt both cereals and legumes, climate smart crops in order to create food and nutritional security. So there are two groups of crops, cereals and legumes that were mentioned in that article. Later on, and very recently, then I saw a review paper on cassava whereby the, the conclusion was that uh, cassava can also be called a climate smart crop. And now that I've been listening to Dr. Mjingi, I know that biofortified sweet potato can also be called a smart crop. Laysa India has defined climate smart crops in the context of livelihoods nutrition and fragile environments. So this definition includes those crops which are important for the livelihoods and nutrition of poor farmers. They include the tubers, the pulses, the millets. So that does not differ much from what Dr. Jiri and colleagues were advocating in terms of climate smart crops, so houses are uh, also legumes. So these crops, they tend to be both underutilized and under-researched. As a result, they have not gained the status that we see with the, a crop like wheat. But they are very important in the sense that uh, they can use the in fragile regions which are subject to frequent droughts, floods, and cyclones. So in selection of climate smart crops, I'm asking that we look at a number of criteria. We are usually blessed with the, so many genotypes so many varieties, Dr. Jamini even mentioned the thousands of indigenous plants which are available just in South Africa. So if we are going to select climate smart crops, we want to look at the genotypes which are available in our African continent. They are several and I've noticed that uh, there has been tendency to only rely on just a few for our staple foods. 
So there are a number of untapped resources in terms of just the, the varieties of crops which are available, which can be used as climate smart crops. The environments also in which they are grown, those are important. And we don't forget the interactions between the genotype and the environment. When we obtain a foods that are now consumed by the larger population, we want to look at which fractions are being consumed and which food production methods are being used. Those are all important criteria to consider. In addition to that, we still want to look at post-harvest factors that can reduce food loss. We know that's a big issue, the food losses that are encountered uh, from production to when the food reaches the consumer and even when the food is with the consumer. So food loss and wastage are important uh, factors which can be added when we are looking at climate smart crops. At the end, what we want is optimal nutrient retention and enhancement in the foods that the population is consuming. So if we look at sorghum and millets as climate smart crops, we know that uh, the composition varies according to the botanical fraction of the grain. So during milling, we can remove the outer layers to produce our refined uh, flour or meal, which is more desirable in terms of it of the organoleptic properties, the sensory properties. But at the same time, we should be aware of the inevitable distribution of nutrients within those botanical uh, fractions. So we may lose some vital uh, polysaccharides, for example, non-starch polysaccharides, we may lose some protein, some lipids, some vitamins and minerals, and also a number of other phytochemicals. A recent work we did on finger millet, which we collected from Malawi, we could identify so many phytochemicals in the form of phenolic compounds. And this is, for me, an indication that our millets are important food sources, even needs they are not yet in the mainstream. They are very beneficial in terms of health promotion. However, those same compounds may also work against the overall acceptability of the foods that are produced from sorghums and millets. So this is work which was done some years back using some of the uh, varieties of sorghum which are grown in Zimbabwe. And producing sorghum meal and then making porridge out of those uh, varieties and comparing with rora meal, maize meal showed us that overall acceptance was not anywhere close to that of rora meal, maize meal porridge. So there's work to be done in terms of enhancing the organoleptic properties of these sorghums and millets. We like to talk about legumes because we have an abundant resource of these uh, varieties of legumes in the region. So, when we combine legumes with cereals, they tend to be very complementary in the sense that legumes are a very good source of protein and the amino acid profile of legumes will complement that of our staple cereal grains. As a result, more work needs to be done in this area in terms of promoting our legumes and the, Dr. Ramini mentioned the Bambara nut, which is one example of a important legume. 
Now, when we look at the, these tubers, uh, Dr. Mjingi mentioned the bio-fortified orange uh, fleshed sweet potato. That's one type of tuber which is going to be important, especially to address vitamin A deficiencies. But there are several tubers that can be used for supply of micronutrients as well. And at this point, they are still under-researched. The problem that we have with legumes, uh, with the, not legumes, but with the, the tubers compared to legumes is that uh, they tend to be very high in moisture content. So tubers have a very high water activity. So that water activity will work against the, a long term storage of these tubers, unlike when we are looking at legumes. So we need to look at processing to produce shelf stable foods. So what lessons can we learn from wheat which has dominated uh, the food world? So we know that with the wheat, you can produce so many varieties of foods and even in Southern Africa, the region where I'm originally from, you can see that people are drawn to wheat products in the form of breads, in the form of pastas. However, there is opportunity to actually use some of our indigenous uh, crops, which we call climate smart crops, to enhance some of these products and reduce the use of wheat flour. So we can still produce the same products, but substituting with some of our indigenous crops. So let's talk about food products and the uh, climate smart crops, because the area of processing has been lagging behind when it comes to climate smart crops. So we still need uh, support systems for both pre-harvest and post-harvest uh, technologies. For example, we need more resources towards agronomic and breeding programs for this climate smart crop so that we identify which ones are the most important for the different regions of the continent. We also want to look at storage and shelf life of these climate smart crops. And what Dr. Mjingi is doing will help if we are producing flour or purees of the tubers. We also want to be in food product development because most of these underutilized crops, they don't have many products to talk about or even to entice farmers to keep growing them. And in general, we assume that they are very safe in terms of uh, any toxic material. The research has to be done in terms of looking at the structure of these crops versus the, the functionality that can be derived from them. So my main area has been more to look at the health benefits in terms of health promoting components. And there is a very big opportunity here because if we are looking at climate smart crops versus animal food sources, there is no comparison. We can be fed mostly from crops compared to animal sources. So public and private partnerships in research and development of these climate smart crops are very vital to their promotion. This is uh, an example of uh, unit operations and key factors that are influencing the final product quality. So this was uh, a discussion on cereal raw materials, what they undergo before they, they can get to the consumer. We can use all these processes and through uh, institutions like CSIR, what Dr. Jamini is doing, we can produce 
more food products from our own uh, resources using a combination of these techniques. At the end, we want to be able to provide not only healthful foods, but uh, acceptable foods in terms of organoleptic, or organoleptic properties. So when I was uh, thinking of the global value chain and our climate smart crops, we cannot talk about the global value chain without looking at the people and the activities involved in the production of those crops. We cannot talk about the global value chain without talking about supply and distribution, not just regionally, uh, is restricting to our continent, but also globally. We cannot talk about the global value chain without looking at other post harvest processes for these climate smart crops. So the question is who is involved in the production? Who are the main players? And when we look at gender and especially smallholder farmers, what is the role of women in this global value chains? There are sustainability issues that are very important when we come to, when we are talking about climate smart crops. The UN Sustainable Development Goals and the 17 Goal Blueprint are very, very useful, but I don't think uh, there is, there are checks and balances in how uh, these are being implemented. So there are several opportunities I see for integrating the climate smart crops into the global value chain for food security. A connection has been established between diet, health, and environmental sustainability. So we need to make sure that we exploit that nexus between diet, health, and environmental sustainability. So we can also see an opportunity then to use climate smart crops found in Africa to address healthy issues. We can identify those which are already loaded with the micronutrients that are deficient in several regions, but at the same time, we can use the biofortification approach, especially where the deficiency is severe, for example, uh, vitamin A. There is a growing demand for protein uh, in Africa and beyond, and the role of plant proteins in climate smart crops is uh, unchallenged compared to animal protein because it takes a lot more. It's not environmentally friendly to use more animal protein compared to, to plant proteins. So we can use these uh, smart crops for addressing global food and nutritional security, especially if we can identify those with the essential nutrients such as uh, the those which are high in iron and zinc, and also those which are high in some of the vitamins which are of concern. So in conclusion, I would say the climate smart crops are very vital to improving food security, and they should include the cereals, the legumes, and the tubers. That their selection is important if we are going to address food and nutritional security in different parts of Africa. However, we do need to integrate the climate smart crops with the global value chain so that uh, the beneficiaries are smallholder farmers and they can have enhanced food security. To be able to do that, we need partnerships between public and private sectors. And Dr. Mshinge has already alluded to that, that those partnerships are very essential to achieve such an integration. 
but the benefits are quite enormous given the nexus between diet, health, and environmental sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Beta, um, for raising some important points. Um, I liked the, the part, the conclusion also on the diet, health, and sustainability, environmental sustainability nexus. It's very important. But also, the, the aspect that food has to be delicious also. I thought that was quite, uh, <laughs> that was quite, quite good. Then, because that brings in all the processing, the storability, and all the other factors. And that's where the research comes in and the partnerships, private public partnerships, they become quite important, which is why also even in these discussions, we try to build, to build the sort of global value chains that we want. We need to have the right partnerships. But at the end of the day, it's about the value. Do we know, do we, how much effort are we putting understanding the value of these climate smart crops? Where is the value and who is benefiting from that value if there are any benefit? Because as of now, it seems like we are still trying to establish that. So we'll ask for questions. My panelists will be available. To, to answer some questions before we can conclude. Thank you.